Welcome to Cities on a Plate, everyone. It's great to see you all. Um, we're in Cape Town today, the mother city uh, of South Africa. Um, go ahead and continue typing in in the chat what city you're joining us all from. Uh, it's great to see everyone after we had a month a month break after London. Um, so hello, Toronto, Hal. Um, we have some Harare cappuccino. It's great to see everyone. And Sophie from Kampala, Uganda, it's really great to see you. Um, this Cities on a Plate series was born out of a lot of quarantine cooking um, last year in 2020, where suddenly I found myself mining childhood recipes and trying to recreate dishes from the places in the world that I've traveled to and lived in. Um, and this year marks a year since we started with the series. So it's wonderful to be able to break bread again together with you all, regardless of where in the world we are located. Today, Cape Town on a Plate is all about exploring the delicious intersection between uh, food and historical, geographical and cultural identities. So we're hearing from Luby Rush, um, a trailblazing indigenous foods innovator and activist. And then we'll hear from the dynamic duo, uh, Portia and Dumai, co-authors of the Africa Cookbook. Um, Tapiwa from Tapi Tapi unexpectedly couldn't make it uh, tonight uh, because of circumstances beyond his control. So um, let's keep them all in our thoughts um, and send them lots of good vibes. As usual, we're going to keep things nice and interactive uh, during the during the session. So feel free to type in any comments or questions in the chat as our speakers are are chatting to us, um, and Steph is moderating, facilitating the chat for us today. Thanks, Steph. And so, starting us off on a wonderfully endemic uh, note, we have Luby Rush, the owner at Making Costs and the founder of Local Wild. Uh, where the focus is on uh, local, indigenous, and wild foods of the Cape. Um, Luby, over to you now. Let me share this presentation. Right. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm not sure whether the audience is predominantly from this continent or from all over the world. I'm just going to assume we're from everywhere. And so I speak about this as if people really know very little about the foods from down in our little bottom corner of Africa. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to be speaking about indigenous foods that come from down here and really addressing the fact that these foods have become quite forgotten and actually just aren't used anymore. So the bowl of food that you see in this image and the berries in the background there, those are foods which are absolutely delicious to eat, but many people really actually haven't a clue what they are. And they certainly aren't um, something that, that people regularly use in cooking. So a lot of the work that I've been doing, if you give me the next slide, please, Lucia, has been set down in the Western Cape, the Cape Floristic region or the Greater Cape Floristic region. So the area on the map, which is sort of green, but then also the yellow bit, um, that is really where the, the Greater Cape Floristic region is. What makes it stand out in comparison to the rest of South Africa and generally Southern Africa is that it is a winter rainfall part of the country. And so also known as Mediterranean climate. So the kinds of foods that grow here are really very different to what you would get by way of indig indigenous foods in Southern Africa in general. So the image in the middle shows some of the sort of vegetables and wild greens that you would, would get along our coastline. The bottom, it, it, the bottom image is the Southern Cape. Um, and it's a part of the country which really was responsible for um, Homo sapiens becoming creative modern man. 
based on the very, very rich, nutritious marine edibles, but also on the very many bulbs and corns that could be harvested from this landscape. Um, so the top right image shows you what's on your bulbs. They're, instead of grasses being the carbohydrate that would be coming from these landscapes, it's actually bulbs and corns predominantly that would give us carbohydrates in the Western Cape. And they're also very, very nutrient rich. So in comparison to say potatoes or rice or something like that, they are incredibly nutritious by weight. Um, so what we see is that for millennia, people who lived here ate from these landscapes and evolved actually here as well. So, and, and for many, many millennia, it was for hundreds of thousands of years, it was sand people living here. And then more recently, in the last 2000 years or so, people started to migrate down south. So you had Khoi people who, who were pastoralist people um, who brought sheep with them and slightly later also cattle. And then the colonists came along and the bottom right image shows you the sorts of ships that you had, which were plying the coastline going off to the east on the spice route, bringing slaves, um, taking land from the local people that were here, trading with them as well, but largely also just beginning to appropriate and bring their culture, bring their foods, and lead to a completely transposed sort of dietary system and agricultural system over time, which we actually, in fact, still live with. So if, you, if we look at the next slide, um, the kind of agriculture that we do today is an agriculture of food that comes from everywhere else. So the circles that I have shown there, this is up in um, sort of going up towards um, the Cedarburg region up the West Coast. It's the Strandfelt. And those are big circles where pivots, pivot irrigation is done and they're growing potatoes up here. And the sort of browner areas are where you have, might have more indigenous vegetation. And our agriculture really is actually just taking over these edible landscapes that sustain the people that lived here literally for hundreds of thousands of years. And if we look at the next slide, <clears throat> you'll see that what has actually ended up happening is that the typical vegetable basket that we have on the right hand side, are all, none of these foods actually come from here. They're all foods that have been brought here with people, also in quite a multi-layered way. So people that came here as slaves also brought, the, brought their food culture with them. And to some extent also brought spices and ingredients and so forth. But what we've ended up with is a kind of agriculture that is not at all sensitive to our landscapes. And we have a monoculture mass production of wheat that is destroying our landscapes. And that is being packaged, for example, you'll find in supermarkets in the city, but also in the rural areas, you'll find these sort of packaged bags of highly processed sugars and flours and tea and coffee and so forth that are the sorts of foods that very, very many people, it's actually basically all they can afford to eat. Um, and the foods that would have been sustaining people are just not made use of anymore. But what has also happened is that those foods, the, the fruit basket on the right, have become the foods that people aspire to. And very often indigenous foods have become regarded as poverty foods. And this is something that applies to summer rainfall um, parts of Africa as well. I think that many of the countries that have been colonized have suffered the same thing where food traditions became looked down on. People that move from rural areas into the city is very predominant in South Africa, don't want to eat the marochs and the vegetables and the fruits and things that they might still remember that they could call on living in rural areas and want to move to the city and eat white rice and so forth. But even people who are interested in indigenous foods, I mean, the knowledge is lost, the access to land to forage it is lost. And that's a point that in fact, I should have made earlier if we move on to the next slide, is that for the next three slides that I'm showing here are some of the forgotten foods that come from our winter rainfall part of the world. So even a Cape Tonian who's born and bred and grew up here, the majority will not know anything here. 
I mean, uh, children might recognize the very middle one, which we would call an Afrikaans syrinx. Um, it's a wood sorrel, which also grows as a weed in other parts of the world. But that is something which kids would have snapped on. And very often when I do foraging outings, people who say they don't know anything about anything local, if they taste that, it will just trigger them straight back to their childhood and having nibbled on those sorts of things as kids. But for the most part, all the other things that are, that are on this slide and on the next one as well, um, where you're seeing some of the next one, yes. So the Fainbos, which is also what the plants of the Cape Touristic region are referred to as, is really known as incredibly aromatic landscape. So if you go walking in the mountains, you brush against plants, they're just the most gorgeous aromas, sort of wild and spicy sometimes, even aromas that will come out of the felt um, as you brush past things. So a lot of these plants are, and I mean, this is the other thing that's very interesting, where the knowledge about indigenous foods in terms of the food knowledge has, has been lost a lot. What is still very alive across South Af Africa, but also in the Western Cape, and I suspect it must be like that up into, into Africa as well, is that medicinal knowledge is still alive and medicinal practices are absolutely still being carried out in South Africa. You can go in, in most of our cities and certainly in a lot of the smaller towns, you'll get people sitting at the edge of the market selling all sorts of things that are used for medicinal purposes. And a lot of these sort of wild herbs and things like that traditionally are used um, steeped in water to drink medicinally. So not as a culinary tea, but as a medicinal beverage. And many of them are actually also pretty bitter. And if we look at the next image, we'll see there also are a vast number of berry seeds and droops and so forth. And the one in the middle is a very interesting one. So that is one of our indigenous solanaceae. So it's tomato, deadly nightshade, so it's a set nightshade. It's the same family as tomato, peppers, um, chilies, so forth. And its closest relative is actually the goji berry. So that is an indigenous bush that you will still get some rural people that will recognize it and as children would have gone walking out into the bush and nibbled on it as they went out without a sandwich for the day and just snacking on whatever they, they would find along the way and there's definitely scope for actually making much more use of that and many of the other berries that you see see in this image the one on the bottom right is one where there is a bit of trade of it so that's a sour fig and it grows as a sort of a ground cover. And that is one where you can buy it dried. And there's a sort of traditional preserve that gets made um, using it. And, you know, these are just a few of the kinds of foods that our unbelievably biodiverse Cape Floristic region is completely full of. So there are about 10,000 species. And the Cape Floristic region is known as a biodiversity hotspot. And what is very sad about it is that about a quarter of those plants are actually threatened. And the threat to them comes from agriculture and also from urbanization. So for example, around Cape Town, um, in the sort of middle of, of the Cape Flats, um, where there's been a massive amount of urbanization, that dune strand felt is um, threatened by urbanization. Whereas if you go up further up the West Coast and the South Coast, then it's agriculture that is threatening those landscapes. So the Fainbos, a lot of the Fainbos is very, very shallow and very poor soil um, conditions. Whereas what we call the Renostafelt, which is another one of the biomes of, of the Cape Floristic region, has very, very rich soils. So that's the one part of our region which has rich soils. And there we have wheat cultivation that's take place and fruit growing and vineyards and so forth that have completely covered the landscape. And so very, very little of the wild landscape is actually left in there. So that's mm -hmm. part of the reason also why these foods are actually not being accessed anymore because the landscapes are threatened. Luby, there's a few questions. Um, one yes. was, 
where could someone find the seeds for some of these berries and foods? And the other question is from Rita, who's asking, how do we get back to actually eating these indigenous foods? Because these are probably now classified as superfoods and could be seen as extremely expensive, which I think is something we've seen with a lot of other plants as they've kind of been co-opted. That's my own commentary, but I yes. will throw it to you. <laughs> so the one of us because our landscapes are so threatened, there is quite a strong conservation lobby in the in the Fanwos or the Fanwos in the Western Cape to try to make sure that some of this biodiversity is really saved. So for example, foraging is not legal in the wild. And if you do want to collect seed or if you want to collect, um, if you want to forage, then you need to get a landowner's permission. And if you want to collect seed, you have to make an application. And so generally speaking, it's very often researchers that might get seed or people, I mean, in some instances, it's also people who are wanting to propagate plants that would get seed. So it's not easy to get hold of seed. Um, and then in terms of, yes, I mean, the reason that I've been doing this, this work is precisely because you know, these foods have, the, the foods that come from these landscapes have survived several climate change events in the last 100,000 years or so. And so there's an incredible resource that is available to us to make use of as we're having to grapple with changing conditions. And so it's actually very important, not only from a cultural point of view, but from a social point of view and from an economic point of view to make use of these foods. So, I mean, I absolutely agree that this is something that we need to do. And if we go to the next slide, um, I mean, I've been working with these foods now since 2010. And when I began, I was working, I was collecting and I was cooking and bottling. And then there was a sort of this resurgence of interest in foraging. So I was doing foraging walks and that sort of thing as well. As well. And it's it's a trend which is on the increase, really also because um, I think that people are feeling the reality of being disconnected from the places where they find themselves living. And so a lot of the interest in foraging is because it's one of the ways in which one can start really discovering where you are and start making use of where you are, just reconnecting to place. And certainly for the Western Cape, I mean, this particularly is pertinent because these foods were always foraged. There's, been, there's no tradition of cultivating these foods. And what struck me after some time of taking people foraging was that actually we're dealing with landscapes and biodiversity that's already under threat. And a lot of what I was doing was valorizing these things, bringing value to them, telling people about them. And I suddenly thought, you know, really, I need to be approaching this slightly differently because otherwise I'm adding to the threat. So it was this kind of odd situation where reviving the knowledge about them, I had to try to find a way to do it in a way where I wouldn't be threatening um, our landscapes, that I could actually be rejuvenating, reviving. And so that's what got me into wanting to do some cultivation. So if we look at the next two slides, you'll see that um, in some of the amazing things that you can do with this biodiversity, a lot of it was, a lot of this has been my own experimentation, but also drawing on the sort of very, very multi-layered, multicultural um, sort of flavor that we have within South Africa and also particularly in the Western Cape where all sorts of people have ended up coming and settling here over the last really actually colonial and post-colonial times. Um, but also the sort of tradition of really just trying things out. So a lot of the experimentation, and if we look at the next slide, you know, these are some of the things that I've been testing out with this extraordinary variety of incredible foods that I was discovering over a period of about six or seven years bottling them, making cordials, dropping, I'll drop everything into a bottle of alcohol to see what sort of color can I get, what kind of a flavor can I get. Um, and if we look at the next slide, you know, realizing that I was potentially 
No, in fact, I can't, um, it's not the next slide yet. So a lot of the interest that has been happening has been in chefs being interested in some of these. So, so for, you know, a lot of foraging chefs, I mean, Noma, for example, in, in, um, um, in Scandinavia, one of the most expensive restaurants on the planet. And Kurbis van der Merwe, who's here in Paternoster, about two hours out of Cape Town, we go to the next slide. I mean, a lot of the interest in these sorts of ingredients has come from chefs. And so what I've also found is in the, in the work that I've been doing to really revive the use of our local foods has been to try to find other people who would also be doing, trying to switch people onto our local foods. So trying to just re, reignite an interest in what belongs here and, you know, I mean, the foraging, the foraging types of people, they're, they're adventurous people, but your average shopper in the years that I was bottling things and, and selling them in market, the same market, in fact, where Luna and Porsche um, still sell, sell, but this was long ago when it wasn't as big and fancy as it is now. You know, there was only a small percentage of the sort of passers by that would sort of peer at these things that were completely unfamiliar and be show a passing interest but we're such creatures of habit that for the most part actually trying to switch people over is 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 quite a business um so if we look at the next one um part of what i felt became important was to start exploring cultivation because i was i just became convinced as the years went by that if I was going to be serious about reviving the use of our local indigenous foods, doing so by foraging only was absolutely not going to be sustainable. I had to find a way of actually starting to grow these things, which had never been grown before. And I, I mean, I would chatter to people around and about, and I just realized in the end, you know, I'm not a farmer. I mean, I did work in landscaping for very many years, but I figured I must just do this thing because I'm not going to convince somebody else to do it. So I managed to secure some money and I planted a garden in Kailicha and put about eight different plants into it. And it was pretty successful. I mean, if you look at the soil in this image, this is very typically Cape Flats leached out. It's like beach sand. And many of the, this is, and this is on an urban farm. So there were about 12 other farmers that were um, small scale farmers growing food organically for a living from there. And here I arrived with my weird foods that none of those farmers really recognized. And I just planted straight into the sand because the kinds of foods that I were planting were foods that are from this kind of an environment. And it doesn't need anything other than rain that falls out the sky and the kind of poor washed out sand that was there and the plants thrived okay. and it was I mean it was interesting to to speak to some of the farmers that were also there who were fascinated by by this idea that I didn't have to add compost and I didn't need to make all these lovely juices and things to pour on the foods to make them grow better because the foods were happy yeah this is this was their environment this is where they came from Luby, I'm curious, what are some of the, uh, you know, you mentioned your, your bottling and your experimentation and then the planting. What are some of, um, is there like a particular plant or that people have really taken to or that people tend to enjoy more? Or has there been some, you know, something that really surprised you in your experimentation, something that people took to more than others? Or? So there's one, one in particular, which, which is very well liked by a lot of people, which is an ice plant. Um, it's, and it's, uh, we also call it Sotsly or Braxly. And it's an interesting one because in fact, it's actually cultivated in Japan. It's cultivated in Israel. I've even been to, a, um, I've seen them microgreens being packaged by somebody in Holland along with all sorts of other little microgreens and interesting colored leaves and things. And yet it belongs to here, but we're neither eating it nor growing it. And it's one of those that when you give it to people to taste, it's a sort of a salty, juicy burst of slightly sour divineness that comes out of it. 
So that did extremely well in the sand. And then dune spinach is one of my favorites because it's just so incredibly prolific. And what I also have tended to do, so the way that I chose the plants to put into this garden was to use things that people would, that could be slightly familiar. So some of them look a little bit like an asparagus and I would, the wild rosemary and white, wild sage are the sorts of flavors that are a bit familiar because they smell a little bit like conventional sage and they smell a little bit like conventional rosemary. You can tell people, just substitute. You don't have to reinvent a new recipe. You can just use a local version in your existing recipe. So actually really lowering the bar of what you expect people to take on that's new and make it as easy as possible for people to engage with unfamiliar food. So if we look at the next slide, so a lot of the work that I did after the, I planted that garden was to realize that, um, yes, we could cultivate, but, and there were some, for example, even on that farm where I, where I was growing, a couple of the farmers started to grow things, but without a ready client base who wants to buy, you weren't you you were not going to get anywhere so one of the things that what i eventually ended up doing was to to found this um, organization called local wild and one of the first projects that i did was something which i called a chef supported agriculture project and i brought chefs and growers into the room together and said come let's actually make this market happen let's not wait for this uh, think we can make this thing happen organically. Let's actually deliberately do this. And it was a very interesting learning curve for me because I discovered that what the chefs and the growers both wanted was information. The knowledge was so thin on the ground that they didn't know what the plants were. They didn't know how to grow them. They didn't know how to use them. They didn't know where to get hold of them. So there were these huge knowledge gaps. And then the other thing that I heard from the farmers particularly was because I was deliberately work, working with small scale and marginalized growers, because I felt that this was a kind of, um, it was an important place to begin so that they, I, we didn't end up with a sort of a reappropriation of knowledge as the, as the revival in using indigenous foods um, came up. So the farmers I was working with and continue to work with a small scale, not wealthy, work, work on small farms. And so expecting them to take the risk in an innovation space was just not fair. And so one of the things that I've really put a lot of effort into is to making sure that if a small scale grower is going to grow, he's going to have somebody to sell to. And so in the three pillars of kind of areas of work within the nonprofit that I'm working with. There's knowledge creation, there's cultivation, and there's usage. That same idea that I had in the Chef Supported Agriculture Project, I've continued with it over the years. And the other thing that became very obvious to me at that time was that the big missing link in the middle, I mean, I, I knew chefs, I knew growers, I could even do workshops, but what I didn't have was the mechanism to get from the farmer to the customer. And I knew an app could do it. I knew it could be sort of online stuff, but I had so much on my plate already that I was damned if I, <laughs> I was going to get involved in developing an app as well. So over the last few years, one of the things that I've done is found people to collaborate with if we go on to the next one. Um, so that really um, by bringing together other people who are also interested in making sure that our indigenous foods get back into our food waste, get back into our markets, um, that together I could find collaborators who would fill the gaps that I couldn't fill. So if, if we look at our next slide, so from the research point of view, so I've got my three pillars, there's the know, there's the grow, and there's the use. So this is a project which has been incredibly dear to my heart, heart up in the Cedarburg Mountains. And it was a project which we called Co-Creating Wild Food Livelihoods in the Cedarburg Mountains. And this was a project where we worked with a group of about 15 to 20 local people. So they're people that 
are predominantly farm laborers and domestic workers because they don't have any land of their own. So their knowledge that remained with them would have been medicinal knowledge that they could make use of as they walked in the mountains and the felt around them. So unbelievably marginalized people. These are, this is a very, very typical community that we still see in our, see in our country where post-colonization, where land, where people were dispossessed of their land, still don't have land back to be able to, so still remain farm laborers, still remain domestic workers. And so working with communities like this to even just bring back food knowledge in, in, in terms of reclaiming identity, lost ident food identity that people have suffered has been very important research work that I've done. And th this is a kind of community who still very actively use leaves and berries and so forth as medicinal teas. Um, and if we look at the next one, so this is a, I, I did some work with a student, master student who's an agronomist. And she did some research so that the left hand picture is an ice plant, which is the one that I spoke about that everybody loves because it's so jolly, juicy, explosively delicious. And then on the one on the right is June spinach. And she did very interesting research work in a tunnel. And then what we also did as part of our experiment was the top images show some dishes that I made and we did a test. I did three identical recipes using both ingredients to see whether people would and she then asked people questions, would, would they buy it? Would they cook it again? Would they grow it for themselves? Just to try to get a sense of what sort of level of interest is there in these kinds of foods? And what was amazing, what came out of the bottom two plants was that both plants helped to desalinate soil. And anybody who knows about, for example, growing potatoes in very, very sandy soil where basically you're taking groundwater and you're irrigating using groundwater, over the years, that soil becomes more and more salty to the point where eventually, in fact, you can barely not grow on it anymore because groundwater being brought and, and irrigating does that to soil. And so there's a very interesting potential to use some of these plants to start desalinating soil. So not only at a food level can these plants be interesting to make use of, but at the level of actually really regenerating our soils, they can also be incredibly useful. So that's from a research perspective. Um, also, one of the projects that I'm working on is, is um, because these plants aren't used, we don't know what their nutritional values are. Some of the summer rental African foods, there is quite a lot of research that's been done there. So many of those have been analyzed, but the Western Cape's foods we just quite simply don't know what their nutritional values are. And that is one of the barriers also to people, because it's at a talk that one of the immediate questions people ask is, well, are they good for you? What have they got in them? Is it vitamin C, vitamin A? And at the moment you have to say, well, I'm sorry, we don't know. So here we are looking at some of the work happening in cultivation. And in fact, what's being harvested on the right-hand side here is precisely ice plant. And so that clump, that zodidi is busy harvesting the plant. That is one plant. And it's phenomenal how one plant, and it's, um, it should be able to repeat harvest over and over and over again from that patch. So the prolific um, grower. And then if we look at the next slide, I've been working very closely with an organization called the Sustainability Institute. They are a very interesting organization that deal, they're an um, education trust. And so they have children from preschool level right through to postgraduate level. And they have both an academic um, stream, but also very practical. So they have food gardens and their students are very often required to go and work in the food gardens. And I got some funding to plant an indigenous food garden there. And as the years have gone by, I'm working more and more closely with them um, on we've, we're getting learning gardens going and we're hoping to be able to do some farmer training there. And then the most recent thing. So finally, that the chef supported agriculture project, the gap in the middle of the app that I didn't want to create. We now finally have, in about two weeks' time, we're going to be launching the local wild food store. 
It's an online platform where in the beginning, chefs and food stores are going to be able to go and buy cultivated indigenous ingredients. So some of the small farmers that have been bringing these things into cultivation will be supplying this online platform and chefs and some food shops will be able to purchase in indigenous ingredients um, from that platform. So finally, after all these years, we're managing to actually put that in place and I'm working with the Good Food Network and with Pedi AgriHub, which is where Zordidi was doing the harvesting to get that platform going. So that is very exciting to me that we've managed to pull that off. So these are the sorts of packages that hopefully we will see in some of our health stores and some we're sort of hand hand picking a couple of outlets so that ordinary people can go to a store and buy some ingredients because they wouldn't have to have to then forage. And then the other thing that's happened very recently is I've just published a book. And so Finally, now that's the other gap that's being filled where people who want to know about these plants actually now can have information in printed form to access. So 22 plants are in this book and this one is a grower's guide and I'm busy writing the cook's guide. So this grower's guide, if you look at the next image, what I've done is to make it very, very hands-on. So the icons on the left-hand side there will tell you how tall the plant grows, how far apart you must plant them, what time of the year you can harvest, um, whether you can grow it as a crop or whether you could plant it in a small garden at home. So for, for householders, food insecure householders, um, information so that they could actually plant at home, um, whether pollinators like it or not. And then also the little map shows which part of the country they grow in naturally. So you could actually tell um, where they like, where they come from. So this first book is, is really pitched at the growers and the next one is going to be pitched at the cooks and we're going to be launching in about two weeks time. So that's very exciting to me. I, I'm, I sort of feel all important that I can now call myself an author along with Lumai and Portia. Yes. Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, Luby, um, I my introduction to you was through this book, The Wild oh, Garlic really? Envy, uh, ah. because Ine, who gave our fabulous um, Joburg on a Plate demo, uh, mm -hmm. did The Wild Garlic Quiche and um, mentioned you as a source of, a great source of, of knowledge on, on things like this. So that's amazing. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it's been, you know, and I mean, it's been a real kind of like juggling exercise because I didn't want to put information out so soon that I would write about all these plants, but you can't get hold of them. So then what's the point of putting the information out there if you can't actually get hold of them? Right. So it's been kind of like when to get the selling platform done, when to get the recipes out, when to get the farmer information out. It's been like sort of which, which ball am I going to actually, and of course, trying to find the money to achieve all of this because you know, the, the, the work that I've been doing has been unfunded work. Um, so, yeah, and then I'm also starting to do some wild food walks at the Sustainability Institute. And there are about 50 plants that we would be able to locate. And then this is um, Maverick Life. This, this week now has just published this piece, which is great. So there's, there's three of us, uh, myself, Rishana Gray and Elzan Simmels, whose work is, is written about in this piece. Um, and you know, that's also incredibly important. And for example, this, this now, um, having these sorts of platforms in the newspapers, you know, um, podcasts and so forth, invaluable to actually waking people up to the reality of, you know, why we need to, to reclaim our indigenous foods, why we need to actually decolonize our diets, essentially. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Luby. Um, I think everyone's really curious about how to sort of translate this all to their own context and start to connect with, um, you know, how can I connect with the land that I'm on mm. currently and, and what are the sort of forgotten and wild foods going on there and how can they help um, with the current state of, of, of the climate and everything. Thank you so much. Um, talking, about, talking about knowledge, so talking about passing on knowledge, um, I heard about our next panelists from uh, literally by word of mouth, um, as in my sister called me uh, from Cape Town a couple of months ago and said, I have just had 
the best pesto. Um, uh, and her rant was all I needed to, to bookmark um, these two for Cape Town on a plate. Uh, so Portia and Lumai are the mother and daughter duo whose dips, sauces, um, and dressings are igniting Cape Town, uh, Cape Town's taste buds with um, lots of magical bursts of flavor. Um, in 1992, Portia, who's a chef, started the Africa Cafe, which was the first um, restaurant in Cape Town serving food inspired by the African continent. And um, together with her daughter, Lumai, who's a graphic designer and food photographer, they published the award-winning um, Africa Cookbook, which won a um, Best in the World Gourmand Award uh, last year. Um, and it's a vibrant collection of recipes inspired by their travels across the African continent. Um, so Portia, it's, and, and Lumai, it's so great to have you both here. Um, I'm interested in how you would describe your culinary philosophy and how you arrived at it. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you for having us here. And I just want to say, Luby, that was absolutely interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that book, <laughs> book launch. Um, Michael, I, you know, I actually just have um, a natural inclination to tasty food. It has to be tasty. For me, um, my the impetus come from eating something that has been cooked with a lot of heart, has been prepared. It may not look beautiful, it should taste good. So I, I guess it's a kind of like eclectic. It's meeting the people that actually I, I get the recipes from. It's actually creating the recipes. But most of it comes from just home. It, I want to eat when I sit in front of a plate of food, it must make me feel like I'm at home home but not home as in a building but home in my heart because I know it was given it was prepared with heart and it goes into my heart with that same feeling so I guess anything that's good culinary experience it can be African it can be any other food but it must have soul I suppose soul food yeah what did you say and I should also answer <laughs> yeah. go ahead go ahead um, yeah, I agree. And I think for me, um, like what has been so interesting in, in our sort of culinary style is traveling and to many different places around Africa and around the world and bringing it together, like learning something valuable that really, that touches you, um, whether it be something you taste or way that something's prepared or it's prepared slowly or who it was made by and then coming and making that in your own home and, and adding to you, you kind of add little like in ingredients to your own style um, and, and therefore you create something new that's your own, but that's connected to all your other experiences. So for me, that's really what like eating and, and making food has, has been about. That's actually exactly what I find you guys um, doing here. So, so the Zambian bean uh, pies are, are my case yeah. in point um, that I recently tried out. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, you know sugar beans, so they're elements that people might be familiar with, but you repackage them in a way that people have never had before. So I know sugar beans, you know, I've had pies, but I've never tasted sugar beans in the way that I then have them presented to me when I follow the recipe in, in, in your book, which is, which is incredible. Um, I'm also curious, so what, what was sort of like one memorable trip and, um, what dish did it inspire? Mm, I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. <laughs> no, <I was> mean, <laughs> I think of one. It's hard to think of one. Yeah, there's so many. There's, there's been really uh, many memorable mm. trips. I can just think of um, when we went to um, Senegal. And Timbuktu. Um, oh. Timbuktu as well. But we went to Senegal and we'd go into, because a lot of our culinary experiences happened when we're going, just in the market and we're shopping. And uh, I think we were buying, was it rugs or carpets somewhere in like some little trader's store. And when it became lunchtime, the, I think the guy's wife just brought out this big platter. It was like a whole fish with rice and veggies and stuff and kind of laid it on the ground where the family was eating and then just gave us spoons and said, 
just eat with us, you know, and mm -hmm. we're like customers in his shop, you know, but he was like, this is how we do, like, just become a part of. And so, and you eat this food, which is made like by the family for the family. It's not a restaurant. They're not trying to, they're not going to charge us for this. It's just like, this is what we do when we have a guest in our space and you're a guest right now and so and you and you're not expecting anything so I think because of that you you just like blown away like that fish was so fresh and that everything was just wow so I can that was really like a memorable experience so yeah. yeah I have a memory of um traveling on a panase which is like a long boat on the Niger river um going from Bamako all the way up to Timbuktu in Mali and um, we just was a family when we drive uh, going on this panace in the river and all along the banks is absolutely stark desert. There's nothing green. And we went along this for three days. We slept on the bank of the river and then the next day we got onto the boat again and off we went. And there aren't many people doing this trip. It's like a few cows you see and people washing their clothing on the side of the river. So it's very rural and lots of mud huts that you can see far in the distance, lots of dust blowing and having this meal prepared of chicken as a boat, as we went along, the boat would stop at different places and uh, you'd see the villagers rushing up to come get a fresh chicken and this chicken being cleaned on the boat, cooked. And it was the most amazing dish to have from, for me, it didn't have, it didn't need lots of spicing. It just had the fact is that the whole um, journey that the chicken took, this live animal to being killed. With the freshest chicken. And the freshest chicken. And it, it was quite, it was tough, but juicy. And it's totally different from any chicken I've ever had. And then for dessert, we just had fresh mangoes. So just the simplest food. Um, can actually taste amazing so the way it's actually presented and the way it's prepared and yeah so for me it's actually simple food but it must have heart in it yeah that's actually exactly how um you know chatting to my sister how even your condiments um sort of how how we perceive them because it is like so my question is like where do you source your ingredients because it does just seem so magical both what you're innovating through the recipe book but then also what you're selling to us packaged in the um as as food of africa the, the mm. spices the sauces the, the dips the condiments um so your ingredients and sort of what is your yeah the ingredients, you we try and source our ingredients from local from local farmers as, as luby said right in philippi there are lots of farmers that grow all uh, organic stuff. And then we also, I also do a lot of um, farming with um, Abalimi. I get my vegetables and stuff from the ladies that are in Kailicha, which is like a township in Cape Town. And they grow all their own vegetables and their, mm. their herbs and everything I get from them. I mean, I love, love buying, which is what I do. I put some secret ingredients in my, um, in all my condiments and that secret ingredient is pure love and it's difficult for me to have people prepare the stuff I prepare because when I prepare all my condiments every single jar has been done by me I don't have the staff member will most probably clean the, the garlic or wash the spinach or wash the condiments or the uh, coriander cilantro but at the end of the day, I make sure that everything that goes into a jar has got an intention that it will satisfy the person who's actually going to use it. And, 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 and I have, I've got to be in a good mood when I prepare food. And so, it, and, but I also make that there's authentic, there's an authentic way of preparing food. For me, food is not just a, a, a production line with machinery and into a jar. Everything is done with so much love. I've always prepared my food with love, even at the Africa Cafe. So it is, it, the secret ingredient is love. So what you are getting there is just the energy I put it into. You've got energy, I've got energy, and I just put it in and I make sure that each person that gets that jar of condiment 
feels the love that's gone into it. And I'll tell you the <laughs> truth. I'll tell you the real truth is that my mom is a little bit OCD. What did you say? Yeah, so, like a little bit. The, 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 the it's, it's called love. It's called love. <laughs> it's called love. Called love. But things have to be just so. So that's why she makes everything herself because the garlic has to be chopped finely by hand or the herb needs to be washed for all the sand like because obviously organic herbs and veg always come really really sandy mm -hmm. it's like no corners are cut ever which is why i eventually got out of the kitchen because we used to have a catering company together <laughs> And I used to be like, I was a chef, but I got out of the kitchen because um, I couldn't take the heat <laughs> because everything has to be just so. That's why everything tastes so good. So she just does it. She, well, not just, but she does the designing of the labels and she has fun with that. Yeah. And yeah, 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 yeah. The visual. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, yeah. About, I'm also curious about how that um, mother daughter relationship has. Um, you know come about or, or you know what what do you find has been most special actually about it being being a mother-daughter duo mm. a lot yeah i think like one of the the best times we both actually reflect on a lot was making our book because we i think like for me growing up obviously your parent is always someone you look up to is like a mentor and especially as we're doing a similar industry i kind of really looked to mom for like okay is you know is this right what should i do here there but in the book i very much had my section which i was completely responsible for and she had hers and like in any good relationship there's like a balance mm -hmm. and everyone respects the other person mm -hmm. no one is trying to say no 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 don't do this obviously there's there's a lot of communication like oh i don't like that picture let's take that again in fact we have a great story of how we shot we shot the whole book which you know as you know takes like a couple months and then we looked over about like 30 or 40 recipes and said not good enough and we reshot it which took us even longer so we, we were also very particular about it but the synergy was nice because i think that we felt like equals like for the first mm -hmm. time for me i really felt like it wasn't just like a parent child we were like we're sisters we're friends and we each had our thing that we felt mm. very much like um yeah yeah and that ownership of yeah. yeah and i think it's the same with the condiments i leave all the social social media <laughs> and all the, the 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 label designs and the flyers i leave that for luma because she knows what she's doing i i don't know which buttons to press and i don't really know i just know maybe a bit of Facebook, a lot of Instagram, but the rest, uh, the TikToks and all the fun stuff, <laughs> which, which I think is what everybody now is into. I don't know how to do that. So I leave that to her and I do all the designing and the creative stuff which she enjoys. And I just make sure that there's stuff to put into the jar and the buying gets done and the production gets done. Yeah. So I enjoy that. I think that's how we work very well. There's a lovely balance between that. Mm. Okay. Um, Mark is asking, can is your book available out to to buy outside of South Africa? We, we so we have sent the book overseas, and mm. our issue at this point has been that it's just been quite expensive. Mm. Whenever we, we sent to Canada, the US, New Zealand, um, yeah, New yeah. Zealand, yeah, it's just it costs more than the book to send it. So if anyone has any better ideas of how to send it, but at this stage it's been expensive. That's the only like hurdle. Other than mm. that, it's available. Um, and how I'm, I'm, I'm curious um, how your holistic, uh, your sort of awareness of a more holistic um, type of food philosophy came out even pre pre the travels, pre what you mentioned in the travels, um, Portia, I guess I'll direct that Portia first. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a big journey we've had as well. I mean, I think we, we did an Africa cookbook because we like traveling through Africa. But as far as our other food journey is also a food journey because I've had a, a wheat allergy. I had a mom who really suffered from diabetes and eventually passed away. Luma had a dairy allergy. So coming from um, a health perspective, I wanted to make sure that I am as healthy as possible, which is where I think my pedanticness with, with using organic and pure ingredients came from. So, and everything I looked at, I, I went through journeys myself. I went through a journey when we just did raw food. There was a time where Luma, I just went, 
she just went vegan. So we, 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 we've had that journey of health, holistic, being aware of body well-being throughout my lifetime, I think, yeah. And how is the um, sort of thinking back to when you started in 1992 mm -hmm. um, with the Africa Cafe, how is people's perception of that type of food, food from different parts of the African or inspired by different parts of the African continent evolved, um, you know, to today, from 92 today, how has that perception evolved? Uh, oh, that, that's, that's a book I should write one day. It, and everybody said to me, why did you move from Johannesburg to Cape Town and decide to open up an African restaurant in Cape Town? When I did it, I just did it because I loved the food. And Cape Town is a very, very difficult place um, for any type of selling. And more so for um, Black women or a black family to open up an African restaurant in Cape Town. Cape Town is seen as from the rest of Africa, they see Cape Town as Eurocentric. It's very European down here. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. It's received in, I, we even with our condiments, because they're called food of Africa, there are certain shops that won't carry our condiments. They see me coming to come and have tasters in their shop. They, we, we, we haven't been treated very kindly as far as the condiments are concerned because they come from me, you know, the way I look. So it's, it's difficult for the first time, I think in towards the end of the year, I want to try and do a market in Johannesburg and see how the condiments do well there. But um, th there's a small following. I mean, it's not a mistake that we started our restaurant in Cape Town for Cape Townians and found people from the outside value what we have, what we were giving them. That's why we had a lot of tourists and foreigners. And then after a while we were known as a touristy restaurant, just because we were supported by tourists, you know, and, and suddenly we became touristy. But um, Cape Townians, no. And, and, and I don't want to use the R word, but it's, it's a difficult market to, for anything for, for, to break into, unless I'm gonna be selling in Kailicha and for some reason or the other, I don't know why on earth I find myself creating products that people would love across the, whether the, in, in maybe the upper income bracket, because um, that's just what I'm producing. And because it's always handmade, it's something I really, I don't, as I said, I don't have like a whole string of chefs. And also partly because I haven't gone to a traditionally culinary school. I'm, I'm, I'm not a trained chef and I haven't trained under any other chef. So there's, 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 there are so many things against me. It has been difficult. Again, our book, thank goodness we're blessed that we sold our book at the Orania market when the country was still open, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, where we then had a lot of tourists who bought our book. The books that went to exclusive books were all just probably returned. How has the shift been from going from um, sort of primarily working with the restaurant and then to the market? The pandemic, you've had to pivot in a way, right? Yeah, to yeah. This, to the market. Uh, yeah. That, that was fairly easy because I did do the markets before when the Oranias market or these different markets that we're doing when they when it started. We were there at the beginning and we were doing um, vegan and raw food. So I've been to the markets before because even though I was running the restaurant doing African food, I was doing different food at the markets. So what happened was with, 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 with the restaurant when no tourists coming, no travel, I actually just went back to the market and but I'm just doing a different product. Some similar because most of these recipes of the condiments are recipes I actually created when I was doing vegan and raw food. And that's why the majority of the condiments are actually vegan. They don't have any dairy. They're all made in a very healthy, holistic way. Yeah. So that was pretty easy. And so what did, what did winning that um, best cookbook, uh, best in the world uh, award, uh, last year what what did that mean for you um for you both i think yeah i think it's it's such like with the book i remember we had many conversations about how 
we wanted it to feel like Africa now and Africa mm. today. Like I feel in so many ways, Africa has become very mainstream and popular, whether it be in fashion, hair, you music. know, jewelry, music, dance. There's so much of like Africa now. But when it comes to talking about food, um, it's still people thinking like, oh, it must be kind of like what people ate back in the day. Do you know what I'm saying? There's still that sense of like, okay, this is what they used to eat. It was like animals and it was all like- Up in flames. Like very basic and no one can envision. We were still actually just today talking about envisioning like a fine dining sort of experience of African food, you know, and what would that look like? Well, I feel like there still isn't enough of that. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to try and show a few pictures as you're talking. Oh, okay, <laughs> awesome, yeah. So I think the amazing thing about being recognized with an award or just more people seeing the book is that mm -hmm. we felt like, because I, I when my with my pictures and the photography we did, we wanted it to look international. We wanted it to look, um, yeah, not, not something which was like, um, the way I have seen a lot of African food being photographed, which is kind of like brown and not looking fresh. You know, that was like the very typical thing of like, it's a stew, it's very uh, nondescript and it's just like blobs of food. We wanted it to feel international. We wanted it to feel like the future, like the now. Um, and so to, for that to be recognized was exciting. It's like, are people seeing it? Are they getting it? Because that's where we are at. We are very much like, path breakers we're, we're already thinking there and we sometimes have to remember that not everyone's consciousness is thinking African food there they just like we want chicken just give it you know so like we're like but we're already there in the future um so that's our kind of vision for African food and so even uh so they've been they've been all sorts of barriers um I'm curious what the journey to publication was like um for you both with the book working with our publishers mm, you can do that um, <laughs> uh, so really it was it was great in the sense that I felt that we had a very clear vision and I think when our publishers um got that they were and also because they are also they're um, a husband and wife team mm. Quivertree who the husband is a food photographer and he has shot a lot of the books that they've done so we already came straight up and said I'm the photographer. So already I was taking a lot of the creative control on board and they were kind of like, great, go with it. Mm -hmm. We like what you're doing. So they let us kind of do what we, we our vision was clear. They didn't feel like they need to mold us at all, edit us. They kind mm -hmm. of let us mm -hmm. be who we are. Mm -hmm. So um, in that way, creatively, I feel like we the book is exactly how we wanted it to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are you thinking of doing ever doing an e-version? Some people have been like, oh, put it on Gundo. So we can buy it. Yeah, yeah, that was actually something we discussed at the very beginning. And the issue was around, so you know, like, because we very also much wanted this, like the the color, the fact that the recipes are printed on like colorful pages with the patterns and stuff. And apparently for Kindle, it has to be like white. So it has to be like black text on white background and, and, the, and the photos have to be able to move. And because our stuff was quite so structured, there would have to be like a whole redesign for Kindle. And they said, okay, let's revisit that in like a year's time. And then COVID happened, et cetera. But um, it was kind of like, they were talking like it was, it's gonna change a lot of the design mm. element of it. It won't look as it does in the printed book. And, Google. And, um, yeah. So Portia, you're in, yeah, you're in this world of design and food photography. Um, and, uh, Sorry, Lumai. Um, but Portia, you also actually do come from a fashion background formally. Yes, I yes, I do. Yeah, I do. And and I um I also have uh, I'm very restless. I can't sit in one spot for a long time. So I've got so I've done <laughs> so I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, which is why I was at the market doing different foods and having a restaurant. And I had a little gift shop where I just kind of did what my passion was. Because as Luma was saying, as we traveled through different parts of Africa, I also collected fabrics because of fashion design. I'm always interested in the prints, in the fabrics, in the woven stuff, in the beads, where they came from, what is the history of the Fulani beads? How did the amber come? How did So I'm always interested. In, what did the Dogon people trade with? They made these little plastic beads. So 
I've got a whole lot of that interest as well. I've got like a huge collection of stuff that I've just collected and some of it I've made jewelry into and some of it I just keep because I just love having the different textures and fabrics around me and, and trying and thinking maybe one day, one day I'll be doing something with these. So yeah, I've got definitely have got a fashion interest. I've also just got a, and which is why I like, um, um, sometimes I kind of say to Luma, what about designing this and designing this? And, and sometimes she says, too much, too much. I can only do one thing at a time. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'm, I've got lots of different interests and I don't just do African food as people think there's, there's oh, there's the only area I play with. I play with a lot of other stuff and, and, and create a whole lot of interesting uh, different stuff. Whenever I see there's a gap in the market or I feel there's a product that should be out there, I just then I go out and create it myself. So yeah, so I do a lot of other stuff as well. Just conventional stuff. I have a comment here. Thanks, Portia, for washing herbs with love. Nothing worse than finding grit in artisanal food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Portia. So I'm curious, so what's next for um, Food of Africa? Portia and Dumai, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got we've got a, a fantastic product we've come up with. You know, when I started my condiments, some of the sweets, the stuff that was sweetened was sweetened with honey. And we had a lot of pushback on that because a lot of people said that's not vegan. Um, we can't have honey because of the bee and, and what was happening with the bee population. There's a whole stuff with the bees. And I thought, okay, I have to satisfy everybody. And in that I then delved into making fruit honey so that I could use the fruit honey to put into the condiments. But then I came across a really fantastic product in doing the fruit honey and they all come up with such different flavors. You just actually take the, the juice and you, you make. And so I've, I've come up with all, I'm just waiting for the labeling here. <laughs> but it's a design of the labels. Otherwise I've got about five different fruit honeys, which are vegan honey. uh, sorry, vegan honeys, which are delicious because you can use. There's one that has got um, very much like a honey. The majority of them come from ap apple juice, uh, re a reduction of apple juice, and and uh, there's pineapple juice as well. There's lychee juice, but there's one that is very, really very close to honey that you can use in your tea. Um, and there's the others that you can use on your pancakes, your flapjacks, your waffles, on your scones. Yeah, you can use it where, if you're a vegan, you can use it anywhere else. And you don't have to be vegan to do it. And so it's also just, it's, I don't want to say it's healthier than honey, but it, because I also love honey, but it's just an alternative for people who don't want to um, eat honey. Mm. Um, you might please, uh, you know, quickly with the labeling. <laughs> <laughs> the labeling. You know, I have my eyes and my um, my palettes on the ground in, in Cape Town. To, to and I want to say, at Luby, I also want to make a pesto from one of that June spinach. So I've also got that still on the back burner. It's not something I have forgotten about. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruby, um, Portia, and Lumai. I'm, you know, it's been incredible to see, um, you know, I've learned so much tonight about forging, forging your own path, you know, when there doesn't seem, just make your own lane if it isn't already there. Um, you know, do your thing, share, um, seek out the knowledge um, and, and, you know, share it. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, a very big thank you also to everyone behind the scenes, Sumian, uh, Steph, Nana, and Jane. Um, thank you to all of you all for tuning in. Biggest thanks of the night um, for coming up. Uh, next month, we're heading to Nigeria with Lagos on a plate. Um, so check your email this week for an invite to that. Um, keep safe and take care of yourselves. Uh, see you on August 29th in Lagos. Thanks, guys. Bye.